Thank you very much. Um, you, did a, you did a great job on those uh, pronunciations. Massachusetts, that's a difficult one. Uh, I'm so glad to be with all of you. Um, when I think of Lebanon, if I may, uh, hopefully it's not too stereotypical, but I, I think when I think of Lebanese people, resiliency and seeking peace. So I'm so glad to be with you and, and share some thoughts with you about what's happening here in New York and uh, in New England. This picture, by the way, is where I changed careers. I was going to be a marine biologist and I, uh, on this ship called the Westward, I decided to go into medicine. So I'm ready to share with you about uh, serving and healing uh, women and couples using this NAPRO technology that you've just heard about. Dr. Amir did a great job. Um, and I'm going to be speaking more from a, a philosophical or an overview approach. And we'll dive into some of the research that we conducted when I was in Massachusetts and, and show how that's a little bit different here in New York. Um, and uh, you'll get to see some of our specific treatments that we are using. Uh, so as uh, your uh, MC explained that I'm trained in family medicine, but over these past 40 years, I've become more and more expertise in treating women's uh, health conditions, whether it be infertility, pelvic pain, unusual bleeding, premenstrual tension syndrome, um, a whole variety of things, even sleep disorders that can vary with various phases of the menstrual cycle. So these things that I've mentioned just now are symptoms. They are not diagnoses. So infertility is not a diagnosis. Infertility is a symptom of many underlying diagnoses. An example of that is if you were short of breath and you were to go to the emergency department, you would not want to come out just with an oxygen tank. You would want to know what was the cause of my shortness of breath. If it's pneumonia, I need antibiotics. Is it a blood clot? Then I need heparin. Is it heart failure? Then I need Lasix. The treatment is different depending on the underlying condition that caused the symptom of shortness of breath. So when we focus on infertility, we see that there is a disorder which is interfering with either conceiving or sustaining the pregnancy. So our job in NAPRO technology and what I like to call restorative reproductive medicine is to figure out which is the underlying cause and study to fix that cause. What is the best way to fix that cause? On average here in New York, we find 4.5 reasons per couple for the infertility. There are approximately 80 different reasons for infertility. And on average, a couple that comes here has 4.5 underlying reasons. So we need to analyze what are the reasons? Could it be blocked fallopian tubes? Well, that gets a lot of publicity, but it's only 15% of infertility couples have something to do with the fallopian tubes. And yet the typical gynecologist in, in uh, New York is going to schedule a hysterosalpingogram before they send them to the IVF center. A hysterosalpingogram to me is a little bit nerve wracking because number one, it's painful. I wouldn't want to have to go through it. And number two is radiation to the fallopian tube area to see the, the fluid coming through, the contrast coming through, but there's the ovary right there. So we're giving some radiation to the ovary. And I don't know about you, but when I go to the dentist, they put a shield to protect testicles and sperm and protect ovaries and eggs. So anyway, I'm not saying that it's a bad idea, but I'm saying if it's only 15% of people, maybe we need to be looking for more common things such as this. Ovulation, approximately 60% of the people in my clinic have ovulatory disorders. Many of them aren't even releasing the egg. They're having cycles. The gynecologist tells them, oh, you're ovulating, obviously, because you're having menstrual periods. Or I did a progesterone level and it was positive. It was above four. Therefore, obviously, you're ovulating. No. 
you have obviously had an ovulatory event such that you're now making progesterone, but it doesn't mean that you've necessarily released the egg. That's a big assumption. Another problem might be implantation. It is so common that people would have chronic endometritis. The lining of the uterus is inflamed. The most common reason for that, I believe, is endometriosis. And again, about 60% of the couples that come here have endometriosis. Maybe it's common here in the Northeast of, New of uh, the United States, I'm not sure, but it's very, very common. Maybe it's uh, less common in other parts of the world. And then of course, there could be chromosomal issues, there could be age issues, uh, hormonal support, maybe the ovary is not making enough progesterone. That is very common here on Long Island. Uh, maybe it's a lack of cervical mucus, especially people that have been on the birth control pill for more than a couple of years, their cervix is not very good at making mucus. I will show you a slide about that in a minute. So the ovary function, very, very important. And thanks to studies from around the world, we know things that help the follicle to become more mature and more likely to become mature such as melatonin, three milligrams of melatonin taken in the follicular phase of the ovary cycle. So it's uh, going in a counterclockwise direction in this schematic. Um, so we're going from antral follicles to a mature follicle, ovulation, and then the corpus luteum for 10 or 12 days. So as I started to say, melatonin helps this process to be better, possibly NAC, um, something called inositol. These are things that we know can help this process to be better. And if we need to, some drugs back here in this phase, letrozole. Um, you'll hear about clomid in a second and why we don't use clomid anymore. So in summary of my introduction, the restorative approach to reproductive medicine is to diagnose and then work to restore. How can we restore if we don't know the diagnosis? And we provide excellent preconception care. Very, very important. It helps the whole success of the pregnancy by doing a very good job prior to conception. That leads to healthy pregnancies. Um, we are working one embryo at a time, not, in, not hoping for two or three to increase our odds of success. No, 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 no. One embryo at a time. And we're working to reduce miscarriage. And very importantly, you'll see in my concluding slide, reducing prematurity. So this the philosophy, the ethics that we take is to repair and to optimize function, as you heard Dr. Amir saying and to protect each embryo. That last statement is to avoid a utilitarian approach where we'll say, oh, let's, in, let's implant three embryos and hope that one takes. That's utilitarianism. Each person is very precious. And IVF, as you'll see in the next slide, loses seven embryos for every one that's born. Here's the study from 2001. United States, um, look, putting together all of the data from the ART centers, Assisted Reproductive Technology Centers. And when you look at all of the um, embryos that were transferred and the number of babies that were born, the, just counting the transferred embryos, not counting the ones that were left in the Petri dish or discarded or frozen for later, just counting the ones that were transferred, they are losing 6.7 embryos for every person that's born. So that's where I use the word utilitarian. We're not supposed to use people. We might use a microwave oven, we might use a car, we might use an airplane, but we don't use people. So NAPRO technology, thanks to the St. Paul VI Institute in Omaha, Nebraska, was the first to develop a comprehensive model of restorative reproductive medicine. Here in New York, it's taken off like wildfire. So many people have been asking the question, why can't I achieve a pregnancy? 
and they go to the gynecologist and the gynecologist says well let's do a hysterosalpingogram and then they go to the IVF center and the IVF center says okay we're going to use these drugs and do this and that and so on and they say it's like an assembly line they say I feel these are their quotes I feel like a number but instead when they hear about what the Gianna center offers they're they're coming here this graphic uh, is just a sort of a schematic representation of what happened here when we started seven years ago there was a good cadre of people that were waiting and, and interested but as the word of mouth has spread we haven't done any advertising hardly at all the word of mouth we are very very busy now to the tune of 14 hours a day so this vision this view is catching on is very popular this is zion national park in utah that's my son peter who's now a lawyer um and uh, we are 1500 feet above the ground there wonderful experience if you have the chance people say i want to come to the united states i want to go to new york and chicago i say yikes go to zion and go to yosemite so now we'll move into this world of infertility and uh Mar maurice can interrupt me anytime i can jump right to my uh summary slides but as you see infertility is very common and this is a little uh, joke to say you know, why are people so interested in IVF? So in the United States, at least, um, they have this promotion, hungry, think Snickers bar. So you can say that around here, say hungry, and people think Snickers bar. Well, the IVF world has, and the media has caught people's interest in infertility, think IVF. So they're bypassing the underlying causes of infertility. So here's an example of a woman who's charting with the Creighton model system. And you see the first cycle up above in her days of bleeding and days of um, uh, observations. And there's no mucus observed in the first cycle. In the second cycle, no mucus. She quit um, charting for a couple months. She's back. She's still no mucus, still no mucus. And then here in the small writing, she starts vitamin B6. And she has one day of cervical mucus. And thanks to her teachers, she identifies that. And there's intercourse on that day. And about uh, five weeks later, here's an ultrasound picture of her fetus. So vitamin B6 is a lot less expensive than IVF. And it solved the underlying problem. How about low sperm counts? Well. I went to a special conference in Boston on low sperm counts. It was a urologist, and he talked about all kinds of surgical techniques and so on and so forth. At the end of his conference, I almost fell over. He said, but having heard all of this technology, the most important thing that you can do for low sperm counts is to improve the woman's cervical mucus. And here's an example. This, um, where the X is, that was a man having his semen analysis accomplished, and his count was only 700,000. The motility was only 30%. Um, this is not the um, Kruger morphology. This is just, a, how's the sperm look? 82% appeared normal. There were some white blood cells. And when you put this all together, you can get what's called an effective sperm count of only 189,000. And yet, in that very cycle, he, he and she had intercourse on the peak day, and they achieved a pregnancy test, a, a positive pregnancy test, and they had a healthy baby. So um, on such a low sperm count with the fertility care system, there's a study out of Germany and a study recently out of Italy that showed charting your cycles is more effective than IVF in achieving a live birth not just with low sperm counts, with any uh, any reason. Um, uh, polycystic ovary, you just heard some presentations about this. How does NAPRO technology help that? Well, we figure out why does somebody get polycystic ovary and we fix that underlying reason. So here's a, a, a neat study that was done in uh, 1981. Johns Hopkins University and their ability to do wedge resections was the best in the country 
at achieving pregnancies in polycystic ovary people. Well, then Dr. Hildreth did his work and all of the things that helped the ovary to work better, and they were much faster at achieving pregnancies at a much higher rate. This is a slide that I promised you about cervical mucus and the birth control pill. So um, bear with me for a quick second. Here is the day of ovulation. Zero is the day of ovulation. So negative one is one day before ovulation, two days before, and so on. And then your different lines here, those are um, a woman of different ages. So the top line is th age 13 to 17. So let's call that the average 15 year old. And um, this is work by Dr. Odeblad in Sweden. And so what he found was that the average 15 year old was making very good mucus. And what is very good mucus? A spin bar kite above seven, okay? So you see above seven happened about six days before her ovulation. Whereas the average 25 year old, maybe four days before ovulation, she, met, she meets a level of seven. And then the average 35 year old, maybe only two and a half days before ovulation. So this is the natural aging process, limiting our days of uh, fertility. Now I'm gonna take this 25 year old curve and I'm gonna bring it to the next slide. So here's that 25 year old curve. And here is somebody who has been on the birth control pill. Let's just call it a year. And here's one month after stopping. She doesn't even reach five for the quality of her mucus. Even 18 months after coming off of the birth control pill, maybe she's reaching seven just for a day or two prior to ovulation. So when I was in Massachusetts, I was very busy helping these people that couldn't achieve a pregnancy after the birth control pill. I was helping them to make better mucus. And we have many ways to help with that. So let me share with you some data from um, New England. Okay, I just checked my time. Okay, so um, many things that we offered them. Yes, basics, a good night's sleep, very important. Avoiding certain chemical exposures. Unfortunately, many of the rivers in the United States are polluted with birth control pills, and that works into the groundwater, into people's water or into the river, into the reservoirs, into people's water. So this is a concern. I, I, I might be one of the only people talking about it, but it's a concern of mine. And so many people will use a reverse osmosis filter to remove some of these chemicals. Um, treatment, um, medications to help cervical mucus, 81% of our patients benefited from some of those, or we applied that um, information, things like vitamin B6 and um, guaifenesin and other things. Um, NAC is very good for the cervical mucus. And we use some ovulation drugs. Now, this is back in the 1990s and, and uh, 2000s. And we were using Clomid 30% of uh, the people that needed an ovulation drug. So of those 62%, 30% of them received Clomid and 48% received letrozole. We also use things like metformin and those people that had um, glucose issues, or, or I should say insulin resistance and, and maybe polycystic ovary, and then supporting the uh, luteal phase. But if we jump forward now to my work um, in New York, we're not using Clomid anymore. There's a great Harvard conference that happens every year on infertility at Harvard University. They said, we are past the Clomid era. They say, doctors, we are past the Clomid era. No one should be using Clomid anymore. It thins the lining of the uterus. It dries up cervical mucus. It could have triplets or quadruplets. Uh, whereas letrozole, guided correctly, may be monitored with ultrasound, can generate one mature follicle at a time. So other medicines that we use, um, low-dose naltrexone, you could read about that. There's a website called ldnscience.org. Take a look at that. Um, thyroid, uh, Dr. Hilgers always teaches us, think thyroid. Um, helping the implantation to be successful using an anti-inflammatory. 
Um, other women needed antidepressants. Um, other women were taking lots of histamines. Would, antihistamines would dry up the mucus and so on. Jump forward here to New York, and I'm not using paroxicam anymore. I'm now using things like pycnogenol and doxycycline. That could be a whole lecture in itself. Um, the the pycnogenol is a natural substance, and doxycycline is probably working more as an anti-inflammatory uh, medicine than an antibiotic. It's so very good for the lining of the uterus in those people that need it. Um, vitamins and supplements, the most important, vitamin D3 and magnesium. Folic acid, of course. Iron, yes, Harvard proved that iron helps the ovaries work better. The ovaries need iodine. It's not just the thyroid that needs iodine. The ovaries need iodine. And surgical treatment, yes, 48% of our women needed uh, surgical interventions. That's a lot. So I want to show you just quickly a couple statistics. The difference between a, age uh, less than 35 and greater than or equal to 35. Over here, adjusted live births. So if you were younger, you had a higher success rate than if you were older. Shouldn't be a surprise, but our studies uh, bared that out. And then the body mass index, less than 25, greater than 25. Adjusted live birth rate, 40% versus 16%. Huge almost a threefold difference if a woman's BMI is down in that range between 20 and 25. Some of my hardest patients to treat though are the ones with a BMI of 18 or less. So here's the influence of BMI on uh, success rate. Um, also, I mentioned uh, the studies in Italy and Germany showing that just Creighton model itself helps uh, achieve pregnancy more successfully than IVF. And this one, this study comes from Toronto. So there's a third study out there that shows it. Here's some of the differences in diagnoses of the people that came to our center. We asked them, what did your infertility doctor say was the problem? And so we have listed what they were told was the problem. 23% of them unexplained. In our studies in New England, we had only 1% unexplained. In Canada, another study done in Toronto, 1% unexplained. Male factor, they said only 10%. We found 30%. Endometriosis, they said only 14% of people had endometriosis. We found 74% in our study had endometriosis. Blocked fallopian tubes, we actually found more than they found and so on, polycystic ovary, unidentified in their work. And then there's another one here, vitamin D deficiency. They weren't even looking. We found 14% of our patients had vitamin D deficiency and that affects ovary function. Limited cervical mucus, look at the difference there. P-value, oh my goodness. So this is what I say is excellent preconception care, figuring out what needs to be optimized. So, Maurice, I'm ready to summarize. <laughs> and uh, so um, this, this slide maybe is a little bit busy, but it's to prove a point. In New England, my success rate at live birth was only 29%. That's still better than an IVF um, process, but uh, I was a little bit disappointed. But in New England, I did not have access to women getting a follicular ultrasound series. So I was naturally held back from pushing the ovary with things like letrozole because I, I it would be the worst press in the world to have a quadruplet pregnancy and people talking about selective reduction and things like that. So I was sort of held back. Here in New York, completely different story. We have an imaging center in almost every town that is organized to understand what we need the ultrasonographer to find. And so here, our live birth rate is approaching 60%, quite a difference. And so that can be summarized here. Without um, ultrasound series, mm, we're kind of hampered. With 
the access to a follicular ultrasound series, checking an ultrasound like cycle day 10, 11, 12, and seeing if the follicle is able to be mature. And if so, I don't need letrozole. If it's not able to be mature, I give letrozole. Also, I want to see, does it rupture correctly? If it doesn't, I need to give them something like Ovidrel, which is a HCG injection. Um, this we spoke about um, age under 35 and BMI under 25, much more success. In the meanwhile, we had only two sets of twins in the 25 years of this study that was done in New England. So our study adds to the growing literature showing that restorative reproductive medicine is a wise approach to infertility. It suggests that the restorative reproductive medicine can be done in a primary care setting. I'm a family physician. And supports that um, um, the treatment results in healthy births. I'm gonna show you that in a second. Here it is. Our prematurity rate, high risk couples for high risk for prematurity, infertility couples are at high risk. Our prematurity was 8% in this 25 year study. Whereas in Massachusetts, where we were, the state average was 8.6%, average population. So we brought a high risk population, chance of prematurity below the average risk because of very good preconception care. The things that lead to infertility are also the things that lead to prematurity in many situations. IVF, the next line, uh, bypasses that. It doesn't pay much attention to these things. Their prematurity rate in Massachusetts, just limiting to the singleton pregnancies, not the twins and triplets, just the singleton pregnancies, they had a prematurity rate of 31%. The same state, the same obstetrical care, 31%. The uh, IUIs, in, uh, intrauterine insemination, had 16%, still double what ours was. And so our rate at 8% was almost um, one quarter of the IVF rate. So this supports the concept that restorative reproductive medicine can result in better maternal health and better newborn outcomes. And my last slide, this is very important. In the United States, we got insurance companies. In other countries, you're dealing with government health care, things like that. No matter who you're talking to, they want to increase value, the value of the dollar and the success rate of the outcome. So what we see with restorative reproductive medicine is that value is added with a healthy pregnancy, fewer complications, less admissions to the hospital, and a healthy neonate, less um, newborn complications and less prematurity. So this is an um, equation here in these bubbles. This is, um, um, I, I worked in the in insurance industry for a while and they talk about this equation that if we can improve the quality and lower the cost, because the quality divided by cost equals value and insurance companies want to have value for their premiums. And if you're paying your premium dollars to this, care, you want to have better value for that. So these are some of the references. It will be there on your screen. Um, Dr. Stanford, oh my gosh, a brilliant guy in Utah, does a lot of research on these topics. And so the, the difference here is that it's oriented to long-term health and success and a healing approach. Here's some uh, uh, websites for you to uh, mark down. So I will stop there. I thank you for your attention and it's good to be with you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Carpentier, for your presentation, for your presentation, which is beyond that. And uh, now it's time for questions and answers. Um, I would like to, to uh, Yes. 
And just so you know, we have three NAP Technology Medical Consultants with us. Dr. Amr is still with us, and Dr. Sophie also is with us. So feel free to ask any one of them. Thank you, Doctor, for this uh, really excellent presentation. I'm also a family physician, and uh, thank you for showing us that natural technology is not uh, a foreigner to, uh, to medicine, but it rather sheds light on uh, maybe because we are under diagnosing uh, or not looking for uh, the causes for uh, medical problems. However, I would like to ask you. Uh, are you backed up with evidence regarding uh, the treatments you are suggesting? You know, with the, with the lawsuits that are being done against physicians regarding uh, surgical procedures, regarding uh, giving medications, do we have really evidence-based research regarding these uh, issues? For example, am I medically backed up with evidence, if I have a patient who is infertile to give her vitamin D6 or melatonin or something like this, I, am I backed up or I, will I face a lawsuit if, if it doesn't work? Thank you. Um, okay, great. Um, um, so the evidence is growing. And much of the evidence comes from research around the world, not necessarily the United States. The United States is enthralled with the IVF movement. Um, and so we have to look elsewhere oftentimes. Um, but the National Institutes of Health here has shown vitamin D3. Oh, my goodness. A, a man who has a low sperm count, if he takes vitamin D3, he is three times more likely to achieve a pregnancy. We have research, tons of research on metformin and even continuing metformin into pregnancy to reduce complications, not just gestational diabetes, but uh, possibly also the chance of um, miscarriage um, and, um, and even possibly reducing the chance of preeclampsia. That one's being debated. Um, the Harvard University study or, or, or the Harvard University Infertility Conference, I try to go every other year. It is excellent. People from around the world uh, gathering to hear the latest research that's happening. For instance, from Columbia University in New York City, they found that the best treatment for chronic endometritis is doxycycline. Over my career, that has been a question for 30 years of what is the best treatment for doxycycline. They tried all kinds of combinations of antibiotics, even intravenous antibiotics, and they couldn't come up with a satisfactory answer until Columbia and a study in Italy showed that doxycycline is very helpful. Doxycycline turns out to be a molecule that I think of it as a figure of eight. It kills germs with this side and it's anti-inflammatory with this side. Very, very successful and proven by endometrial biopsies. And the list goes on and on and on. And so we're trying to gather this information together, but the IVF industry is very um, powerful with money. Uh, and we are busy in practice, as I said, 14 hours a day trying to publish this stuff. And so Dr. Joseph Stanford and the International Institute for Restorative Reproductive Medicine is trying to have doctors like me that are scattered around the world submit their cases, submit their data, not just individual cases, but data to this uh, program that's going to be called STORM, S-T-O-R-R-M. The R-R-M is Restorative Reproductive Medicine. Just like in the United States, the IVF centers have to report to the uh, federal authorities. What about the guidelines from the ACOG? Why don't we have new guidelines uh, yeah, integrating these, uh, these updates? Why aren't they being used? And what about uh, medical students and residency programs? Uh, it's very important, you know, in medical school and uh, residency programs, we encourage our uh, young physicians to, uh, to really have uh, a holistic approach to their medical cases. How can we integrate NAPRO technology into residency programs and uh, you know, integrating it in medicine rather than uh, having it uh, as a single entity to just attend lectures recording. 
Yes, this is excellent question. I feel, I, I feel like I don't want to. When I die, I don't want it to all disappear. Kind of thing. It's not just on me, of course. But when we die, we don't want it to disappear. We want the medical students to be exposed to that, right? So um, there's a group called Facts, F A C T S, Facts. You should look this up, uh, sharing the uh, the information about fertility care in medical school. They started by interviewing medical students and they said, how many of you would be comfortable teaching somebody about natural family planning or restorative reproductive medicine if it was your patient? How many would you be comfortable? And only about 5% were comfortable. And then they said, how many of you understanding what it is now think your patients should have access to this? And 85% so they said there's a big knowledge gap in the medical schools. Only 5% feel comfortable and 85% think it's important. So FACS is trying to get into the medical schools and teach them. It's evidence-based information. It's available out there. Okay. But we just got to bring it into the medical schools in an evidence-based fashion. So good question. Any other question? Right. Uh, allow me to thank you, uh, to thank you, Dr. Carantia. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Thank you, Doctor. Just I was uh, just thinking about also bringing that for the nurses also because we are at the Faculty of Public Health at Sargent University. Also, we have a Department of Nursing Sciences. So it's very important what you have teach us today to bring it also for our nurses, because our nurses are also, we, uh, we teach them to be uh, health educators and to, uh, to play a leadership role in the society. So not just in the hospitals, so also between in the community also. So thank you for this uh, conference. And uh, we hope that we will have uh, material that we can introduce in our uh, lectures with our students. Thank you. You're welcome. Nurses are very, very important in both directions, okay? They can help promote this information, but also my patients complain over and over that they the nurses that they met in the gynecologist's office were poo-pooing this. They were just saying, go to IVF. What are you bothering with vitamin D? Why are you bothering to take metformin? Just go to IVF. So, so you're right. The nurses are very important. The patients would, would attest to that. So uh, thank you for bringing that up. I love to teach nurses and nurse practitioners. Um, very, very important information. They can say a crucial in that Dr. Carpentier, we have uh, nurses and we have also midwives. So uh, I would like to uh, I, I would like to ask also what can the midwives do that maybe the nurses can do or the gynecologists or family medicine physicians cannot do. Uh, so the the midwives are much more attuned to uh, the, the woman's body and her physiology. That's that's fantastic. It's almost like the 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 medical students get sort of caught up in the pharmaceutical industry or the pharmaceutical applications and, and options. So uh, I, I love it when my patient says, I'm going to go see a midwife after we've achieved a pregnancy. I, I, I just love that. I say, you'll be very uh, content there. They will listen to your questions, they will, uh, try to explain the best they can. But um, the midwives also are going to be caught up with miscarriages uh, potentially premature birth or potentially uh, cervical shortening and things like this. So um, they're, they're, they tend to be, the midwives in general, tend to be more attuned to the value of progesterone support. Um, progesterone is known to be um, uh, prevent uterine contractions and the shortening of the cervix, you know, so progesterone, if you have a low progesterone level, you're going to be in more trouble. I find that the midwives uh, have really a chance, an opportunity to, to help intervene for these patients. Uh, thank you. Actually, I'm glad that we are here today. It's true that we are 30 people, 30 people only, but this is a group representing a multidisciplinary um, healthcare professional because we have um, medical students, we have physicians, we have midwives, 
nurses and uh, other uh, professions in the, in the healthcare. Because I think in the 21st century, we are at a, at a point where we need a holistic approach. We need um, patient-centered care, which is based, of course, which is evidence-based. We should not use the Band-Aid um, uh, techniques, as Dr. Amer uh, said. So um, it's true that maybe this is a long afternoon after a long day at, at work, but I think uh, this is a very a good opportunity to, uh, to think twice before we give um, medication uh, just as a band-aid. And plus, when you talk about vitamin D3, I, um, um, originally I'm a cell and molecular biologist, I'm a researcher, and I've always looked at vitamin D3 as a hormone, not as a vitamin, because I know exactly how it goes into the nucleus, how it affects your hormone. So this is not a joke. Uh, it, this is a hormone. This is not a random uh, 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 vitamin. So people should have critical thinking, starting medical school, nursing school, midwife school, until uh, they practice medicine and treatment. So this is a very good opportunity for me to thank this multidisciplinary team, to thank Dr. Amer, to thank you, Dr. Carpenter, to, to thank also um, um, uh, Marise uh, and uh, Mrs. Slabe, because uh, actually Marise has a flight tonight, so and uh, she insisted on being here uh, today with us. So I really hope that this NAPRA technology won't be like uh, um, an electron which is completely out of the medical uh, treatment, because. Um, I've seen it as something which should be included in a holistic approach in an evidence-based center, patient-centered approach. So thank you very much, and I hope that we will meet uh, soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we will let you know about the training that we're having in November for practitioners in Lebanon. We're coming from the states, faculty, and hopefully medical consultant to teach in Lebanon so that people can start learning in person. Now I teach, I have even few clients here that I teach them, but I, once, I'm, once I head back to the states, I'll be teaching virtually. But God willing, starting November, we will have a few ladies teaching on the ground in Lebanon. And we have with us Dr. Riyad Shrevi, who is finishing his application to become an Apple Technology Medical Consultant here in Lebanon, in Zahri and Dar al-Ahmar. And we have already another doctor, I'm not going to mention his name, who already completed the application and applied to the institute. So thank God we are on, uh, we are on a good path to really bring a model and Apple Technology to Lebanon. Yes, and uh, I want to just thank also Dr. Sophie Saab, who's been really instrumental in helping us to bring the trade into Lebanon. And uh, she was uh, one of our, our presenters at the webinars we did in March and April. And hopefully in the future, we can have her and Dr. Amr and maybe Dr. Kamfati also in person for conference for medical professionals so we can raise awareness of this and technology and the creative model system. So thank you for your support. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.